America has observed the National Day of Prayer for 65 years, and organizers say with war, terrorism, economic uncertainty, and a consequential election in November, we need to pray now more than ever. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, but the times and the world around us are in chaos. If there was ever a day when God's people needed to grab a hold of God, and to invite his manifest presence back into our midst. Today is that day. City bus hijacked today with passengers on board. The terrifying moments that followed had happened in Washington, D.C. An armed man attacking the driver and then getting behind the wheel. The drama coming to a sudden and violent end when the hijacker struck a man. Tonight, authorities are now looking at a key piece of video and ABC senior justice correspondent Pierre Thomas has that video tonight. As the bus hijacking comes to a dramatic, violent end, police descend on the scene, surrounding the suspect who's still inside. Police will be pouring over this difficult to watch video recorded by a bystander on his cell phone. Only feet away, just out of frame, is the dying victim run over by the bus. It was crazy. I don't, I don't know why, why people do that. It, very crazy. It all started at this quiet bus stop. The suspect got on here, no one anticipating what would happen next. Within 30 seconds, all hell breaks loose. The bus proceeds to the next stop. The suspect then attacks the driver. Uh, all the passengers flee from the bus uh, immediately when they see the attack. The suspect now in control. The bus, a moving weapon, races down D.C. streets a quarter mile to its final tragic destination. It was all over in just three minutes. The bus driver was wounded and an unnamed pedestrian senselessly killed by the still unidentified suspect now in custody. His motive tonight, unknown. We move on now to the toxic train wreck in the nation's capital. The cargo train jumping the tracks early this morning, up to 14 cars derailed and at least two of them leaking dangerous chemicals. Emergency teams now trying to contain those leaks. Tonight, 14 rail cars, some packed with hazardous chemicals, scattered across the tracks after a major derailment in Washington, D.C. It was 6.40 a.m. when the train, three locomotives, and 175 rail cars jumped the track less than three miles from the U.S. Capitol building. The train had split. Looks like the train has come apart. And I'm looking at one train that's leaking the chemicals. The accident jolting nearby residents. They said it was a leak and I didn't know if it was something that could be harmful to me, my neighbors, the environment. Another tweeting, I wake up to a boom and sirens. I find out a hazmat train derailed with sodium hydroxide. It is a chemical similar to bleach or, uh, or Drano. Sodium hydroxide, a dangerous chemical if it touches the skin. Another car leaked ethanol, a flammable liquid. First responders stopping the leaks within hours. Tonight, investigators are still working to figure out what caused the derailment. In another big story today, the largest automotive recall in American history has more than doubled. An additional 35 to 40 million Takata airbags have a deadly flaw. Jeff Glor is following this. This issue is urgent. On March 31st, we had the 10th confirmed fatality in the United States. NHTSA Administrator Mark Rosekind said today the effort to replace defective Takata airbags has to move faster, even though the task is monumental. Replacement inflators need to be specifically engineered for each of the affected vehicle models. The problem is ammonium nitrate, a volatile chemical that Takata Corporation started using more than 15 years ago to cut costs. Ammonium nitrate breaks down over time, especially in high heat, high humidity climates, and can cause the airbag inflator to malfunction, potentially sending shrapnel through the vehicle. Over 8 million inflators have been replaced so far, but that's less than 12% of the total inflators now involved. Making the fixes has not been easy. Drivers across the country have been calling and waiting. Hundreds of injuries have also been linked to the faulty inflators. 40,000 striking Verizon workers are on the picket line for the fourth week. The company has made what they are calling its last offer. Today was a national day of action for the striking workers. Have a look at what the protests looked like in New York City today. We're fighting for a fair contract. It's not about a 7.5% raise. 
That's what the company wants you to see. CWA, we're not going away. And here in the nation's capital, union workers marched outside of Verizon store asking people on the street to boycott the telecom giant. Melilla Chan has our story tonight. Extended protests for Verizon union workers as the strike expands across the country today while shareholders hold an annual meeting in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Almost a month in, where about 40,000 workers have walked off the job protesting against the communication giant's plans to limit pay raises and offshore a lot of jobs to Mexico and the Philippines. Have a listen to what some of the union picketers had to say. They just went back to the table uh, this week, and so far there's no uh, progress being made. But we're, at least we're talking. The strike's going to continue until Verizon respects uh, working families. The U.S. coal industry is in a fight for its very survival. Job losses have accelerated here in southern West Virginia, with more than 6,500 miners now out of work. And West Virginians, by and large, lay the blame at the feet of Barack Obama. I'm directing the Environmental Protection Agency to put an end to the limitless dumping of carbon pollution from our power plants and complete new pollution standards for both new and existing power plants. John O'Neill is the majority whip in the West Virginia House of Delegates. The war on West Virginia jobs and the war on the West Virginia energy industry is so bad that uh, at the time this administration took office, there were hundreds of functional coal mines in West Virginia that were producing. Now, only 30 some coal mines are actually producing coal right now in West Virginia. And it's a fraction of what it was when this administration took power. Uh, it's been devastating to our state. Hillary Clinton earlier uh, blaming coal companies going bankrupt, and there's been a lot of them uh, on the markets. Now, yesterday, the U.S. Justice Department dismissed the Mur Murray uh, Energy lawsuit that held up President Obama's Clean Air Act. Obama, of course, uh, his agenda has always been to crush coal, and let's face it, he has succeeded. In 2008, coal was responsible for almost 50% of electricity. Last year, it was down to just 33%. And the bankruptcies, you're talking about amazing companies, amazing stocks. Look at those charts, guys. Arch Coal, Patriot, James River, Walter, Alpha Natural Resources, and of course, with those bankruptcies, thousands, tens of thousands of jobs. Bob Murray, he's the Murray Energy founder, CEO, and president. Good to have you this morning, sir. Good morning, uh, Sandra. What do you make of the political environment around coal right now? It's disastrous, and it's disastrous for every American. Hillary Clinton has vowed to continue to the destructive policies relative to energy of the Obama administration. So, Bob, and I want to interrupt you because I want to make sure her, her words, the, what she has said during that town hall that everybody's been talking about are, are made clear. She said uh, she was going to, quote, put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Since she made those comments, she said that those were uh, out of context uh, and she didn't exactly mean it that way. Uh, Hillary Clinton is untruthful there. She said it, and this past weekend, Bill Clinton said she will do what she says she wants to do. She has destroyed so many lives. Obama's policies will continue. It will drive electric rates in this country up by $300 billion. She wants to substitute $0.04 cent a kilowatt hour coal-fired generation mm -hmm. for 26 cent a kilowatt wind and solar which is unreliable depending on whether the wind blows and the sun shines mm. and it will destroy low cost electricity in America for every mother that's listening to support a family hey, Bob, it will for want... people on fixed incomes and for people who manufacture a product mm. for the global marketplace mm. she has no knowledge of the electric power industry and what she is doing will be a continuance of the disaster of the Obama administration relative to energy with no environmental benefit whatsoever. Hillary Clinton is in hot water after being confronted about her anti-coal sentiments by a mountain state resident who lost a job in the struggling West Virginia coal industry. Watch this. When you make comments like, we're going to put a lot of coal miners out of jobs, these are the kind of people that you're affecting. This is, this is my family. And while my hope is in God, that's my future. I just want to know how you can say you're going to put a lot of coal miners out of, out of jobs and then come in here and tell us 
how you're going to be our friend. Because those people out there don't see you as a friend. I know that, Bo. And, you know, I am i don't know how to explain it other than what I said was totally out of context from what I meant. Because I have been talking about helping coal country for a very long time. All right, so were those words of hers taken out of context? Well, here's what she said back in March. Take a look. I'm the only candidate which has a policy about how to bring economic opportunity using clean renewable energy as the key into coal country because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Those people labored in those mines for generations, losing their health, often losing their lives to turn on our lights and power our factories. Now we've got to move away from coal and all the other fossil fuels. Oh, put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of work, out of business. Today, oil closed at $46 a barrel. That is 20% lower than a year ago. Oversupply has producers like Alaska over a barrel. Ben Tracy reports the nation's tallest state is in a $4 billion hole. Alaska is known for peaks that reach for the sky. But right now, the state has a mountain-sized hole to fill. We need to fix Alaska. We need to do it now. Bill Walker is Alaska's governor. If you closed every public school and jail in this state, would it fill the hole? No. If you laid off every state employee, would it fill the hole? No. The problem is oil. The price per barrel has fallen off a cliff, from a high of $107 in 2014 to as low as $26 earlier this year. Oil and gas revenue funds up to 90% of state spending. The money pays for every bridge, road, and school. We've had this, this roller coaster of an economy because we hooked our horses to, to one commodity, oil, and we rode it up and down. Is this the day of reckoning? This is the day of reckoning. Walker wants state lawmakers to impose Alaska's first income tax in 35 years and cut the annual check each resident gets for their share of oil revenue. Oil companies would pay more too. Taxes go up, credits go down, there'll be less production. Kara Moriarty represents Alaska's oil and gas companies and says they will be forced to further cut production and jobs. Last year, there were 19 working oil rigs in Alaska. Today, there are 10. When we fail, the state fails right along with us. To continue to ask more from us at a time where we're losing money, it will have economic impact. I applied to minimum four jobs a day. Rodney Cantu was laid off when Shell recently abandoned its plans to drill off Alaska's north coast. Families are concerned. What are they going to do? How are they going to make next month's rent or mortgage? People in Detroit face a growing crisis this morning over basic services nearly three years after the city's record-setting bankruptcy. Detroit is expected today to turn off water service to thousands of households. And for the second straight day, nearly all public schools will be closed by teachers calling in sick in a wage dispute. That leaves 47,000 students with no place to go. What a story. Dean Reynolds is in Detroit. Dean, good morning. Good morning. Well, despite what you may have heard about a Detroit renaissance, thousands of people in this city are struggling this morning to keep water running into their homes. And the city is facing a second straight day without teachers in the schools. No justice, no peace. Detroit teachers were in the streets instead of in the classrooms on Monday. The sick out was called because city schools are expected to run out of cash July 1st. That means no money for teachers, summer school, or special education programs. Our school system is falling apart. Ivy Bailey haven't. is the interim union president of the Detroit Federation of Teachers. But nobody should be asked to work and not get paid. Nobody. Late Monday night, the union called for another sick out on Tuesday, saying in a statement, we do not work for free, and therefore we do not expect you to report to school tomorrow. Detroit schools include buildings in major disrepair, some infested with mold and rodents. In debt for several years now, the schools have stayed afloat by taking short-term loans from the state and now owe $3.5 billion. But the Motor City is facing another major problem. 20,000 households owe money on their water bills and have chosen not to take advantage of city payment plans. Starting today, the city of nearly 700,000 
will turn off the water supply to those homes. Gary Brown is the director of the Detroit Water and Sewage Department. We do not want to shut anyone off. It costs me money to do that. We want to get them on a payment plan and give them the assistance that's needed. President Obama visited Flint, Michigan this afternoon. During a meeting with the local officials, Obama drank a glass of filtered water. He said uh, filtered water is safe for anyone over the age of six. But the president stressed replacing pipes in the city is still a critical step. Obama called on all levels of government, local, state, and federal, to help in fighting the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. You hear a lot about government overreach. Oh, Obama's, he's for big government. Listen, it's not government overreach to say that our government's responsible for making sure you can wash your hands in your own sink or shower in your own home or cook for your family. These are the most basic services. Adding to the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, more than 20,000 Detroit residents will have their water supply turned off. The city's water department claims those residents haven't paid their bills. Some critics have called the water shutoff a human rights violation. It's no surprise Detroit residents clearly are frustrated with their local and state governments, and they're fed up with all of the corruption. It's a part of the world that's known for its snow caps and clean water, but even here in Colorado, lead is a concern. Last summer, the town of Firestone tested the water at 40 of its homes. We found 11 homes out of those 40 um, that came back with um, high lead levels exceeding the 15 parts per billion. That's the maximum allowable level in the U.S. 23 water systems in Colorado are currently dealing with lead that exceeds the so-called action level. According to studies by USA Today and the Associated Press, well over 1,000 other water systems in the U.S. have also crossed that line. The Southern California Gas Company says the costs associated with the Porter Ranch gas leak have more than doubled. SoCal's parent company, Semper Energy, now estimates damages to be around $665 million. The leak, which lasted nearly four months, is the largest in U.S. history. It spewed a year's worth of greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and forced 8,000 families to temporarily relocate. A scary series of incidents unfolding at supermarkets in Michigan. A suspect accused of spraying a toxic mixture of chemicals on food has now been arrested by the FBI. ABC's Pierre Thomas has the latest. Today, the FBI and the Michigan Health Department racing to see if anyone got seriously ill from a low-scale chemical attack to contaminate food. The FBI believes the man in this photograph went to at least three grocery stores in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Whole Foods, Meyer, and Plum Market, spraying produce with a toxic combination of hand cleaner, water, and Tomcat mice poison. Its key ingredient, bromodialone, which prevents the blood from clotting and can irritate the skin to the touch. It's very creepy. I'd like to wring his neck just to see who it is. Those stores targeted in the last two weeks. And according to the FBI, the suspect visited several other grocery stores in the Ann Arbor area in the last few months, and the investigation is ongoing to determine if any other stores were victimized. He has indicated that in the last couple of weeks, he's been in a, a couple of other grocery stores. So um, we have notified them. While sources say the man may have mental health issues, and there's no indication so far of terrorism, this is another example of how vulnerable we are. I think we have to ask ourselves, does this happen anywhere else? Zika virus may spread further in the United States than first thought. The virus, which causes crippling birth defects, was known to be carried by a mosquito that is mostly limited to the south. But now, Zika has been discovered in a second species that ranges as far north as Maine and Minnesota. It's important to remember there have been no cases of mosquito-borne Zika in the U.S., but health officials believe that time is coming. Two major fires we've been tracking all day. First, that toxic inferno in Houston. At one point, thousands told to shelter in place, black smoke from the fire blowing across the city. Barrels full of hazardous substances sparking fireballs. Black clouds hanging over the streets, school children evacuated. Tonight, firefighters are on the scene, and ABC's Matt Guppin leads us off from Houston. Oh my God. 
Look at that. Holy moly. That towering firestorm at this warehouse complex near Houston. Oh, there's another one. Starting as a house fire. 20 minutes later, the four alarm fire exploding, setting off this chain reaction explosion, one warehouse after another. Another explosion right there. 3,000 residents bordering the complex were told to shutter all windows and doors. Parts of that warehouse wound up in that lady's backyard. A nearby elementary school with more than 600 students evacuated. Nearly 200 firefighters racing to the scene. That column of thick black smoke visible for miles towering over the city. Beautiful blue sky day and then out of nowhere black smoke just started coming up and it was massive and it was just a fireball. Witnesses say it sounded like a war zone. Those bullets started popping man it was, it was, it was scary that's when the police came and said get out of here. Barrels detonating like powder kegs. Officials concerned the fire blasted pesticides and solvents into the air. They have 55 gallon drums and liquid pallets of chemicals and they started to heat up and explode. They were popping going 200 feet in the air and then raining down liquid fire and it was just spreading like crazy. Firefighters battling the flames for six hours. All that's left, a moonscape of charred cars and melted barrels. David, firefighters continue to put out the hot spots. Even though some of the buildings here continue to burn, that as the all clear has been issued after that shelter in place. But the major concern right now is that pesticides have leached into the soil, might be running off into local waterways. The Obama administration made a promise to curb gun violence and today issued a progress report. That report includes a technology that some in law enforcement believe could be flat out dangerous. Correspondent Kevin Cork reports on the new technology that's already taking fire. In unveiling his latest push for smart gun technology on the White House blog, President Obama today laid out his plan to use executive action to speed up its use and development. To prevent accidental shootings, smart guns use high-tech features such as fingerprint activation that allows only certain users to fire the weapon. If we can set it up so you can't unlock your phone unless you got the right fingerprint, why can't we do the same thing for our guns? If a child can't open a bottle of aspirin, we should make sure that they can't pull a trigger on a gun. It's the continuation of an effort that kicked off in January when the president tasked the Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, and Defense to study advanced gun safety technology, resulting in today's 17-page report, which promised further research and collaboration with local law enforcement in the future. In addition to boosting development of smart gun technology, the White House says its plan ensures that background check providers would get the federal mental health records of those prohibited from buying guns. Guns. Meanwhile, very strong reaction tonight, Brett, from the National Rifle Association. Spokesperson Jennifer Baker telling Fox News, President Obama's obsession with gun control knows no boundaries. She goes on to say, at a time when we're battling terrorists both abroad and at home, this administration would rather have the military focus its efforts on the president's gun control agenda. Learning as we come on the air that an American service member was killed by ISIS in Iraq. He was on duty when he took direct fire. Just moments ago, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter made this announcement. I'm getting some reports now that uh, an American service member has been killed in Iraq. Our thoughts and prayers uh, are with that service member's family. It shows you it's a serious uh, uh, fight that we have to wage in Iraq. ABC's Martha Raddus has the latest. She joins us from Washington this morning. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Robin. What we now know is that enemy forces penetrated the front lines of Kurdish forces in northern Iraq near the city of Mosul, which is controlled by ISIS. The U.S. was providing support for the Kurds as they countered an ISIS assault. But this soldier, who was reportedly several miles away from the front lines, was still caught in the direct fire and killed. A defense official tells ABC News this morning that after ISIS broke through that front line, American American fighter jets sent in support carrying out 23 different airstrikes with F-15s and drones. This is the third American to die in Iraq since the U.S. returned to a combat role there in 2014. We're going to turn now to those stunning images right here in New York City. And the investigation launched tonight after an historic church went up in flames. The church built in the 1850s tonight in ruins, gutted by a devastating fire. Heavy smoke and flames pouring from the stained glass windows and the roof. 
ABC's Lindsay Janice is on the scene this evening. The fire breaking out just hours after holiday services. Oh my gosh, this is getting worse. Tonight, investigators searching for what sparked this raging inferno. Flames shooting out of a giant circular stained glass window. 170 firefighters battling the ferocious blaze for hours. I'm personally heartbroken. I can't believe it's actually happening. Parishioners crying and hugging, watching the building burn. Just hours earlier, the Serbian Orthodox Cathedral posting this image of hundreds inside celebrating Easter. The owners had taken painstaking efforts to restore this landmark built in the 1800s to its former glory. Tonight, a cathedral reduced to rubble and a few stone walls. David, in a strange twist, there were three major Orthodox church fires in three different cities worldwide, all of them around their Easter holiday. Investigators say no direct link as of yet. It could just be an odd coincidence. Here at home, federal authorities are taking action on North Carolina's controversial bathroom law targeting the transgendered. The Justice Department has sent a letter to the state saying HB2 violates Title IX of the U.S. Civil Rights Act. That threatens billions of federal school dollars to the state. The letter gives North Carolina until Monday to, quote, remedy the situation. Tonight, in the case of a man accused of plotting to blow up an Aventura synagogue, we're now hearing from a man who accuses him of stalking in the past and describes how the suspect's life went into a downward spiral. CBS 4's Carrie Codd joins us live from outside the temple. Carrie. Yeah, Rick, for the past month, the FBI says that suspect James Medina focused his attention on the synagogue, making maps of the grounds, looking for surveillance cameras, and figuring out when and how to cause the most damage possible. When he arrived here Friday, investigators say he thought he was getting ready to detonate a bomb. Instead, he was about to become an inmate in the federal prison system. The FBI says James Medina wanted to kill Jewish people at this Aventura synagogue because he believed Jewish people were responsible for the world's wars and conflicts. In a video that the FBI says Medina recorded before trying to carry out the attack, he said, I am a Muslim and I don't like what is going on in this world. I'm going to handle business here in America. Aventura, watch your back. ISIS is in the house. The feds say Medina wanted to inspire others to carry out similar attacks nationwide. I feel churning and churning in my stomach because of why? Why against the Jews? Recent figures from the State Department show that far fewer Christian refugees from Syria are being allowed into the U.S. than Muslims. Since the beginning of 2016, 1,103 refugees have been let into the country. More than 95% are Muslim, less than 1% are Christian, even though 10% of Syria's population is Christian. Christianity is on the decline in Europe and something else is starting to take its place. Muslims will soon outnumber practicing Christians in Europe. That's what the Justice Minister of Belgium told a committee of the European Parliament. He explained it is not because there are too many Muslims, rather there are generally fewer practicing Christians. And the country's Deputy Prime Minister added, quote, the worst thing we can do is to make an enemy of Islam. Super Thursday. Britons voted on Thursday to elect new devolved authorities in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. The opposition Labour Party has suffered great losses at the vote. Of the two main parties, Labour held 40 councils down one and 768 seats down seven and the Conservatives had 19 councils and 467 seats up nine. Meanwhile, Labour lawmaker Sadiq Khan is tipped to be conservative multimillionaire environmentalist Zach Goldsmith to become London's mayor. If he wins, Khan would become the first Muslim mayor of an EU capital. Well, people are calling Prime Minister, UK Prime Minister David Cameron racist after he accused London's Muslim mayoral candidate Sadiq Khan of the Labour Party of having links to ISIS. But London could be on the verge at this very second of electing Khan their first Muslim mayor. Joining me now is Zudi Jasser and Mike Gauss. Uh, Zudi, I want to start with you. A lot of different things here. Now, on one hand, uh, you, you know, you've got a, a Muslim who may become the, a mayor of one of the major cities in the West. I mean, with one of the longest histories. Uh, and then there's people who would say, this is a great thing. This is a sign that multiculturalism works. What do you say? 
Well, I mean, absolutely. Uh, if he happens to be Muslim, that's great. Well, that is a sign that multiculturalism works and that it's a, we have a fabric of community involved in politics. But this is not just any old Muslim. This is an Islamist. If you look at his history, he supported the waving of Louis Farrakhan's uh, uh, inability to come to Britain. Over 15 years, he was banned. He defended him. He's defended Islamists at Cage, an organization which, was, which is uh, um, ridiculed because of its support of ISIS uh, sympathizers like Mzawi and others. amusement park ride. Uh, this is video uh, of dozens of passengers on an Etihad Airways flight who are recovering after the turbulence you see here. Severe and unexpected uh, struck the plane. Roughly 30 people in all were hurt. Several of them had broken bones and head injuries. In fact, it, it, you can see there's a hole in the overhead compartment along with some serious ceiling damage. After a horrifying 45 minutes of this in the sky, the plane did manage to land safely in Jakarta, Indonesia. It's a healthy sized catch, but tons of shellfish like these have been contaminated by a giant tide of red algae in this corner of southern Chile. Thousands of tons of salmon and sardines have also been infected and left unfit for human consumption. The salmon industry, its employees and its suppliers cannot cope with this crisis and will not survive further inactivity. We're losing more than 10 million consumers every day because of this paralysis. It's not just the fishermen who are suffering. For days people come but they don't buy. They're afraid of even eating fish, so we no longer know what to do. The government has declared a state of emergency in the region and offered compensation. But that isn't enough for these protesters who blockaded local ports. What the government announced will not help us. There is no way we are able to live on $150 a month. Experts think intense El Nino weather patterns have warmed Pacific waters more than usual and nourished the algae. Others blame the fishermen themselves for altering ecosystems with intensive farming to maintain Chile's position as the world's second biggest salmon producer. Consumers are also taking the hit from a reduced harvest. Chilean salmon prices in Brazil have increased by more than 700% in recent weeks. What caused a mass fish kill in a lake in Haikou City in South China's Hainan province. Images of workers collecting the dead fish were posted on social media. According to local newspaper reports, workers have already cleaned about 35 tons of fish from the lake. Authorities are urging people to stay away. They're also examining samples to try to determine the cause. When we think of earthquakes in the U.S., we might think of Los Angeles, but the southeast is the last place in the country that comes to our mind. Now, our location on the interior of the North American plate places this region far away from any fault or plate boundaries where seismic activity generally occurs. However, the area has seen a considerable increase of events. Just in August of 2011, a 5.8 earthquake northwest of Richmond, Virginia, struck the capital region with then a series of aftershocks. Now, the tremor not only woke up many residents in northern Virginia and Washington, D.C., but directly affected the infrastructure of the Washington Monument, the National Cathedral, and many other famous landmarks of the nation's capital. But it doesn't end there. A report recently released by scientists with the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, have likely found the cause for these rare earthquakes, and it appears that we should be getting ready for more. This is the 43rd eruption the volcano has experienced this year. Columns of ash spewed 
as high as 4,100 meters into the sky, setting the highest record so far this year. And the Japan Meteorological Agency set the alert level at 3 out of 5, and that means limitations were placed on mountain trips. 47 volcanoes are monitored by the agency all year round, and the eruption frequency for Sakurajima volcano has been relatively low this year. A massive airlift, meanwhile, continues this morning for thousands of Canadians with no other way to escape the raging Alberta wildfire. Sparks and fire rain down on residents fleeing one burning neighborhood. Nearly 90,000 people have now been forced to evacuate. Thus far, more than 1,600 homes and other buildings have been consumed by the fire. The Fort McMurray fire has wiped out an area now larger than New York City. Ben Tracy is just outside the fire zone. Ben, good morning to you. Good morning. We're here at a roadblock on Highway 63, where later this morning a convoy of stranded evacuees will hopefully arrive safely after passing through what is left of burnt out Fort McMurray. Now, colder temperatures this morning are helping slow this fire, but strong winds have still pushed the flames closer to more homes. The fire burning near Fort McMurray is relentless. Overnight, surrounding a nearby lake with a fiery orange glow. This fire proved just how unpredictable it can be heading south and north, devouring everything in its path, crossing this road, and is burning up this forest. 80,000 people already escaped this. Ashes are flying all over. They say they have crews en route. Flames topping treetops and tearing through the city of Fort McMurray. People fled on the only two roads they had. I can feel the heat through the window. This is what was left behind. A city so burned out, it looks bombed out.